learned more this summer because uh, I planted a lot in our garden. So even more than we had, we're up to 92 species. So I'm pretty pleased with that. But what I'm going to talk about today is making your yard a bird haven. Um, and I'm going to spend most of the talk giving you lots of really practical advice on how to attract birds to your yard. Um, and let me tell you, if you live around here, there's no reason you can't have 40 plus species of birds coming to your yard. I mean, it depends upon a variety of things, but um, you can be really successful with this. But um, just a couple of points. First off, virtually all of the slides, any bird you see is a native bird, um, a local native bird. Um, and secondly, I'm, though I'm gonna spend most of the talk being really practical and giving you advice, I'm gonna indulge myself a little bit in the beginning and start off by talking about why is it that you should want to make your yard um, a bird haven? I mean, why do we need birds? Uh, and so that's how I'll start. Whoops, it always takes a minute to get it to work the first time. Come on, come on, there we go. All right. Um, According to the president of the National Audubon Society, nearly half of our birds are at risk of extinction this century. The good news is, is that doesn't have to happen. That's actually a low ball number. If you, he means full extinction, totally gone. If you add in also almost extinct, you're up to about two thirds of our birds. And this isn't something that's only going to happen in the future, it's already started happening. We have about 30% fewer birds in the US right now than we did in the 1970s. So, uh, and, and the rate at which they're disappearing uh, and shrinking in number is increasing. So um, this, this, they really are in crisis. Now, the reason uh, that bird numbers are going down, down so much is actually, you can point to five main reasons. The first is climate change, and I'm gonna come back to that. That hasn't been such a big problem yet, but it's gonna be the biggest problem pretty much from here onward. Also habitat loss, anytime we drain a wetland, anytime we knock down a forest or, or pour concrete over a prairie, um, there's less food for them. Um, insect reduction, people, uh, a lot of people don't like bugs, so they use lots of uh, pesticides. And almost all birds, almost all land birds do eat insects, at least during the breeding season. And so if there's no insects, they have no food to feed their young. Um, forage fish decline, which is especially bad uh, in the Puget Sound. I mean, forage fish are being lost all over our coastlines, but we're particularly hard hit here. And so bird species that are doing fine in a lot of the rest of the country uh, are, are having trouble here. And finally, cats. Um, cats take a huge number of birds, and I'll come back to that point in a little bit. But I do want to talk a little bit more about how climate change affects birds, because this is the biggest challenge they're facing right now. The first thing is, is climate change affects their migration. Um, birds are very finely tuned for hundreds and thousands and millions of years. They've been very high, highly tuned to start migrating when they do. And they start migrating so that when they arrive at their summer grounds or their winter grounds, the food sources that they depend on are at their peak. But the problem is, and again, especially talking about migration in the spring where they're going to their breeding grounds, um, they rely on insects. Almost all, all land birds, even the ones that eat seeds, rely on insects while they're breeding. And insects are timed to different things than birds are. And with climate change, there's beginning to be a mismatch and birds are arriving at uh, their breeding grounds past the peak food source for them. And so they're having trouble finding enough food. Also simply because as the world gets warmer and drier or wetter, depending upon where you live, um, the plants they need are more scarcer or even gone. The same for the insects, because as you all know, plants require you know, a, a, a particular climate envelope. They can't grow where it's too cold. They can't grow where it's too hot. They need a certain amount of rain. And if you disrupt that, the plants that these birds have evolved to, to, to depend upon um, are scarce. Um, also because of climate change, the habitat has changed. So the example I'm giving here is that with sea level rise, 
wetlands become more brackish. Many wetlands along our coast are, are less brackish than the ocean because fresh water flows into them. But with sea level rise, they become more and more salty till they mimic the um, so sea level rise. That's a typo. Um, they become more brackish like the ocean. Um, and again, the plants and animals the birds depend upon aren't there. With climate change, we're seeing longer, hotter uh, droughts and dry spells and birds need water as do the plants they depend upon. We also see increased forest fires. Um, you know, we've been, we've been living that the past bunch of years. And lastly, um, because the oceans become more acidic with climate change, um, there are fewer shellfish and forest forage fish for them to eat. So there are other reasons besides these, but this is enough to, to prove my point. I hope that climate change is gonna really affect birds. Now, why should you care? Why do birds matter? And I mean, the short answer is, is that plants and other animals need them. I mean, they need plants and other animals, but other animals and plants need them as well. And let me highlight the reasons for you. The first is, is that birds are pollinators. And globally, there are about 7,000 7, 7, species of plants um, that solely rely upon birds to pollinate them. And, and, and to be honest, those are largely in the tropics that solely rely on birds. And some of those plants in the tropics are commercially important, like bananas and mangoes and nutmeg. Um, and so they'd be gone if there weren't birds. But locally, and I saw in the chat that some of you were mentioning this, there are a lot of plants right around here, native plants, that um, at least partially depend upon, in this case, hummingbirds. Orange honeysuckle, manzanita, flowering curtain, uh, currant, salmonberry, red huckleberry, um, our native roadies, black twinberry, uh, bee balm, Sitka columbine, Pacific bleeding heart, there are lots and lots and lots. That's just a sampling of them. So we need our plants need the birds to pollinate them. Even more importantly, birds disperse seeds. 85% of our native wetland plants rely on birds, not on insects or the wind, to disperse their seeds. And that is so true. They have so co-evolved to depend upon birds. Birds get food because they eat the seeds and they eat the berries or the fruit that the seeds may be in, but they've co-evolved so that many, many, many of our wetland species, the seeds won't germinate unless they've passed through a bird's gut because the seeds have a very thick outer husk. And if the acid in their digestive tract, the bird's digestive tract doesn't strip it away, the seeds won't germinate. And so um, these plants need birds. In fact, it's because birds, uh, eat fruit and nuts and then poop them out somewhere else. I mean, that's basically why fruits and nuts uh, evolved. Local species, and again, I could go on and on, but certainly Nootka Rose, Farewell to Spring, uh, Big Leaf Lupin, um, are all, all have their seeds dispersed by birds. Even more important in terms of the impact is birds eat plant predators. And by this, I mostly mean insects, but I also mean things like snails and slugs. And if you have a healthy bird population, you can reduce insect predation on plants by up to 90%. There've been all sorts of studies looking at this where uh, they take an orchard, for example, and they cover up some trees with a mesh so that insects can get in, but birds can't. And you can see how much less fruit is produced. And the answer is usually, even though the birds may take a little fruit themselves, they're taking far less than the insects do. And so you always end up with a net gain. Uh, so they're eating plant predators. My favorite illustration of how important this is, for those of you old, some of you may be old enough to remember this, was Mao's war against the sparrows. Um, Mao Zedong, of course, was a, you know, the, the great dictator in, in China and um, people had to do what he said. And in 1958, he instituted what he called the war against the four pests. And the four pests were flies, mosquitoes, rats, and of all things, sparrows. He thought that sparrows were eating too much grain. And so he ordered Chinese peasants to kill all the sparrows they could. And of course, people obeyed. And sparrows essentially went extinct in China. Uh, 
in the late 1950s. Well, what happened, this was in 58 that, that this all started, in 59 and 60, there were locust and grasshopper swarms that ate so many of the crops that they, the, that's the main cause of the great famine in China in which 30 million humans died um, because there were no grains to eat. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty dramatic uh, illustration of how important it is to have birds around to eat the insects that otherwise are eating up the plants. Another reason birds are important is that they and their eggs are food for other animals. So here you've got a raccoon eating some sort of egg. And last but not least to me, they're just simply beautiful and they sound beautiful and the world wouldn't be quite as nice a place without them. So anyway, that's why I hope I can convince you that it really is worth putting some effort into um, making your yard uh, a better habitat for birds. Um, and again, there are lots and lots of birds in this area that you can attract to your yard. I, I can sit in my yard and I, I, sitting in my yard, I have seen 54 species of birds. I have slightly less than an acre just north of Lacey. Um, of course, how many you get is gonna depend upon a number of things and which ones you get. What you've planted, do you have any snags? Are you providing supplemental food? Do you provide water? And are you in the middle of the field? Are you in the middle of a wetland or bordering a wetland? Or are you on a lake? I mean, depending upon what the nearby habit is, the habitat, of course, you're gonna see different birds. So with that, we can turn to some practical tips on how to make your garden a bird haven. And basically it comes down to six strategies and I'll talk about each of them. Three of them are you protect birds from, and the other are you provide birds. So the protect from is predators, window strikes, and toxins. And then you need to provide them with food and water and shelter. And the nice thing, especially talking to the Native Plant Society, is that there's one intervention that does four of these things. If you were going to do one thing, there's absolutely one thing that kills everything else, and that's plant native plants. Uh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's the best thing you can do for birds besides saving our native plants because um, native plants provide food, provide shelter from the elements. They reduce the need for toxins because they grow naturally here and they provide shelter from pred predation. So native plant, I mean, when I give this to other groups that are not native plant people, particularly interested in native plants, I mean, I really just drum this home over and over again. If you don't do anything else, plant native plants. Um, and again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but I wanted to say native plants have other benefits as well. First off, they're gonna entice the insects that our birds need to feed their young. Um, and that's good. They reduce the need to water because they're used to uh, our climate. And they reduce the need to mow, which, you know, is polluting and noisy and, you know, not nice in all sorts of ways. All right, so now let's start going through my six strategies and I'm gonna start with helping them avoid predators. Um, let me see what I got there, there you go. Help them avoid predators. Um, the, the animal that, that does the most predation on birds uh, in the United States by far are cats. They're, they're, they're much better at getting birds than, than dogs are. And estimates are that 50 to 80% of all cats uh, do take birds, uh, at least some of the time. And um, I want to point out to you that, uh, first off, I own a cat, so I'm not an anti-cat person uh, by any means, um, but cats take a lot of birds. Um, estimates are between, the lowest estimate I've ever seen is one and a half billion birds a year in the U.S. are killed by cats. The highest I've ever seen is close to four billion birds a year are killed by domestic cats and 15 million mammals. Uh, so, I mean, they, they are, whether or not they bring them home to you as presents, they're catching them uh, if they're outside. Um, I often get questions about, or people will say to me, well, my cat doesn't catch birds because it's declawed. Declawed birds catch cats, believe me. Um, also, I've had people say to me, oh, my cat can't, can't catch birds because it has a bell on it. Bells are meaningless. Bells are meaningless. Birds have no natural instinct to avoid a bell. And by the time it learns to avoid a bell, it's a meal. So putting bells on cats makes you feel good, but doesn't, doesn't really stop the, uh, you know, stop the problem. 
The birds that are most at risk from cats are any bird that nests on or near the ground, any bird that feeds on the ground, and young birds in general, because they're clumsier and not as savvy as their adult, you know, as their parents. So what can you do? What can you do? I'm certainly not saying don't have cats. Oops. But one thing you can do is you can keep them indoors. And because, um, you know, they can't, they can't kill birds if they're inside. Um, this is something that if you love cats, you should be doing for your cat's sake anyway, because probabilistically your cat will live a longer, healthier life uh, if it's indoors. And veterinarians basically uniformly uh, advise that people keep uh, their cats in the house. Now, I know that if you've let your cat out and it's, you know, seven years old, it's going to be hard to start. But if you start with a new kitten, uh, most new kittens who've never uh, been outside take to it, to it very well. Um, so that's one strategy. Another strategy, whoops, sorry about that. Got all these spare slides in here. I don't know why. Um, um, is you can take your cat for a walk on a leash. Again, some cats tolerate this better than others. Some cats enjoy it. I once had a cat who had enjoyed it. If you start when they're young, um, cats can learn to take walks on leash with you to go outside. My own personal favorite solution is this one. Uh, those aren't my cats, but I happen to own that same yurt. And my cat basically lives in it during nice weather um, because she can feel the grass under her feet and she can look all around uh, and get lots of stimulation and smell the smells, but she can't get to birds. And also it's harder for dogs and things to get to her. Um, so, you know, uh, this is a really great idea, I think. Uh, so my cat's outside all the time, but she's in her yurt. Um, another thing you can do because uh, some people, sometimes people say, well, it's not my cat. I'm keeping my cat indoors, but I've got neighbor's cats that are sitting under my bird feeders. What do you do? I'm not pushing this particular brand, but there are lots and lots of cat repellents. Most of them have a smell that isn't particularly unpleasant to humans. Um, like some of them, the one I use uh, smells kind of like a sour apple candy, um, but Cats don't like it, and uh, you can keep them out of, you know, the most vulnerable parts of your yard. I also uh, just wanted to point out to you that uh, since cats are a problem for birds, and feral cats are even worse than domestic cats because they're outside all the time and no one's feeding them, um, that you really should spay your cats because uh, you've got a female cat uh, that produces two litters a year with just under three surviving kittens per litter. If you do the math, this is exponential growth. After this says nine years is 11 million cats. After 10 years, it's more than 80 million cats from a single pair of cats. So please, please, please um, spay your cats. If cats are a problem because uh, they're wandering around your neighborhood, a, a really smart thing to do is to be sure to elevate any food or water that you put out for birds because they tend to be particularly vulnerable when they're when they're washing themselves. They, they tend to be distracted and annoyed and they're making splashing sounds so they can't see a cat approach them. I've got the picture on the right just to show you that cats, you know, have some stretch. So it, you got to really raise it significantly off the ground. Um, but that's, you know, cats are a problem, but those are the kinds of things you can do. The second thing you want to prevent, uh, or you want to, you know, to keep birds safe and, and make your yard a good place for them is, is to prevent window strikes. Um, between, I mean, the estimates are all over the place. The lowest one I've ever seen is about a hundred million. Um, and the highest I've seen is a billion birds per year killed, uh, in window strikes. And a lot of homeowners, think that the big problem um, is either glass office buildings or um, wind farms. Far more birds are killed uh, hitting uh, homes, private homes, than, than either of those other two. Um, th there's no doubt about it. And if they don't get killed, sometimes what happens is, is they kind of get stunned or they break their wing and then they're very subject to predation. So it ultimately ends up killing them. Well, there's two very different reasons birds hit windows. I kind of divide it in half. There's daytime strikes and there's nighttime strikes. Different birds, different reasons. So let me start with daytime strikes. Um, daytime strikes usually occur either when you've got a highly reflective window 
And so the bird, you know, sees trees and it's flying so it can land in the tree like in this picture. The other instance that it happens in is when people have a lot of plants or even one good sized plant inside their window, the birds don't see the window. They think, oh, there's a nice plant. Um, and, and they crash into the window for that reason. The birds who hit your windows during the day are primarily local residents, okay? They're birds who live here. Night strikes, on the other hand, are almost always migrating birds. And what they do, they're sort of like moths drawn to a flame. When birds migrate, they've got lots of different ways of navigating, but one way they navigate is to look for light. Um, gets them where they need to be, following the moon. Um, and so when you light up your house in an otherwise dark area, it becomes a, a beacon of light and that confuses them. So uh, brightly lit houses at night are a problem. So what can you do? What can you do? Well, this is always counterintuitive, but if you've got a problem with uh, a lot of daytime birds or birds hitting your uh, windows during the day, uh, and you've got feeders out, is move your feeders closer to your windows. I know that's counterintuitive, but the reason why is, is if your feeders are five or 10 or 15 feet away from your windows um, or further, first off, if they're hitting your windows, it's because they're seeing something inside that they're finding appealing. But, but it takes a while for them to build up enough speed to have enough force that when they hit the window, they injure themselves. If you move your feeders closer than two feet to your window, even if a bird decides to try to fly through your window, it's not going to hit it hard enough to hurt yourself. It'll just bounce off and fly away. So you might try moving feeders closer to your windows. The second thing you can do that's very easily is to partially close curtains or blinds. I mean, if you've got level or like blinds, I mean, just put them down and twiggle them. So, you know, you've just got got thin lines you can look out. Um, not always possible because plants that you have may need a lot of light, but if you can move house plants away from windows or if you've got one particular window that's a problem, move the plants away from that window and see if another window is better. For birds who are hitting your house at night, use motion detectors on your outside light so it's not constantly lit up, but only if you know, somebody or something is walking in your yard. That saves you electricity too, so it's good for that reason. And if you do have outside lights, point them downwards, not upwards. Um, and that, that's good for light pollution in general, so a good thing. So those are things you can do. Another thing you can do that's really, really effective, and I've got these on most of my windows, is there, again, uh, that, this actually happens to be the company I use. These are, these are my decals, but, but there are lots of different companies out there. Some companies make mesh, some make decals. The reason I like these decals and there's other companies that do it too is from the inside of the house, what you're seeing from the inside of the house when you look out is like the left. I won't say it's invisible, but they're very, very subtle. On the outside, what the birds see, because it's highly reflective and they see different frequencies than we do, um, is much, much brighter and shinier. So the birds really see them um, and you don't see them very much at all. The problem with decals is that one decal isn't enough. You have to put several on a window, certainly a bunch on a, on a big sliding glass door. Um, but you know, it, it's if you like birds and you like having them around, you may think this is a good investment. Um, I can tell you that plastic owls don't work for more than a few days, so they're not worth investing in. So, so much for preventing window strikes. The third thing you want to do is you want to prevent poisoning. Um, about 67 million birds a year uh, in the U.S. Uh, die from eating some chemical that they shouldn't. Um, and there are four different ways that chemicals get into their body. Um, say you spray your rose bushes with, with, with some pesticide and a bird lands on the rose bush. They actually can absorb the chemical into their feet. The second way they can absorb the chemical is if their, their body brushes against any of the leaves or the flowers and then they preen themselves. You know, that's how they wash. They, they take their beaks and and, and the way a cat washes itself by licking, they, they, they pull their feathers through their beaks, that's called preening. When they preen, they're ingesting the poisoning. 
Um, also, the poison can get on foods that they're trying to eat and that will kill them. And it can also get into the water. Um, and so uh, really try to uh, avoid using uh, uh, pesticides and herbicides. And again, another problem is, is that herbicides and pesticides um, reduce our native insect population. And I, I just keep saying it, but about 70% of our birds here rely mostly on insects during breeding season, that's what they're feeding their babies. So you, I mean, if you're gonna have a healthy ecosystem, you need insects for the birds to eat and they'll take, uh, you know, they'll take, mo you know, lots and lots of insects and should really, really, really uh, reduce how many are, are hurting your plants. And when I say poisons, I'm talking both about pesticides um, as well as herbicides. So, so both of those are things to try to avoid. Uh, and native plants let you. Native plants uh, are a lot more robust in this way than, than, than many of our uh, imported plants are. If you are going to use some sort of chemical, then what you should try to do is not use a big broad-based one that kills everything, but a very targeted specific one um, because they're less harmful to other organisms. Um, you can also plant plants that repel insects. There are some plants that insects don't like the smell of. Dill and marigolds are well known for that or that attract predatory insects. And so you've got insect eating insect. Um, and fortunately, a lot of uh, our native plants do that, attract insects that eat other insects. So I mean, good old dug firs and madrones and elderberries and snowberries do that. Um, Oh, and, and, and other plants that repel insects by themselves, I should have said, besides dill and marigold, would be parsley and rosemary as well. Okay. So those are my three prevent, you know, prevent birds from, from interacting with these things strategies. The next three are all things that uh, you want to give them. And so the first thing is give them shelter. And uh, there are four major ways to provide shelter for birds. So there's leaf litter, there are brush piles, there are snags, and then there are houses. Um, and so let's talk about each of those. Okay, this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, a lot of people put up bird houses um, because they think they're they're you know they're going to attract birds or it's good for birds. But almost, I would say 85 or 90 percent of the the bird houses I see are, pardon my French, crap. Um, they're not helping birds. They're, you're actually hurting the birds by putting these up. If you want to help birds, putting up a birdhouse is a great thing, but it's got to be a good birdhouse, not just a pretty birdhouse that you found in some store that you like the look of. So what makes it a good birdhouse? So different birds require different things, but in general, uh, these are truisms. So first off, it has to have the right fit. And by fit, I mean the overall dimensions have to be right for the bird. And there are hundreds of sites you can go on. If anybody's interested in this, I can give you resources, email me, uh, you know, that'll say, I want to attract bluebirds. What should my house look like? And, you know, we'll, we'll tell you that. But it has to have the overall dimensions and it has to have the right size entrance hole. Basically, you want an entrance hole that is just like a quarter of an inch bigger or an eighth of an inch bigger than the biggest part of the bird you want's body, because you don't want larger animals, birds and mammals coming in to the house. So it's got to have the right fit. It's got to have ventilation holes. And if you have some birdhouses that don't have ventilation holes, just take a drill and drill them. Um, you know, it, it gets pretty hot here in the summer and in an enclosed place. Um, what you want to do is you want to just take a drill and just drill some holes into the sides of the birdhouse. This helps with airflow. Um, and, and keeps them a lot cooler. Similarly, similarly, you want some drainage holes. Same thing, just take a drill and poke some holes in the floor. That's even more important because birds are living in there, they're pooping, you know, the, the, the baby birds come out of the shell and there's liquid, um, there's the remains of their meal and there ends up being a lot of moisture and liquid. And if you don't drain it away, it breeds bacteria and uh, the birds can get sick. It's a really good idea to have either an overhanging roof or even better, an entry tunnel, okay? 
Um, if, if, if you have a flat fronted house with no overhang, what happens is, is, is animals like raccoons sit on top of the house and they just reach in uh, through the hole uh, and, and pull out the baby birds. Um, so if you have an entry tunnel and you can just glue one on, you know, right, right at your, your birdhouse entry, then they can't do that. Okay, they can't just reach in. Um, for the same reason you don't want to have an exterior perch, you're just making it easy for a crow or a raven to land there and reach in and eat the birds. Um, since the entry hole is supposed to be no, not much bigger than the bird's body, it's very important that it be smooth, not rough. So sand it down well so that it's smooth or else you're going to snag their feathers. Um, wood is certainly the most preferable um, uh, material to make especially untreated wood. So there's no, uh, you know, no toxins in there. And you want the interior to be unpainted because the birds are going to chip away at the paint and eat it. And that's not good. Um, you want to have a hinged roof or floor for easy cleaning because birdhouses have to be cleaned out. Uh, if you want to keep birds healthy at the end of the season and you want it to be well positioned. And again, well positioned means different things for different birds. But, um, you know, so for example, different birds like different height houses. They need different amounts of, of takeoff room, you know, so how far is it from an obstacle? You don't want to put it too near your bird feeders if you have any because there's too much traffic there and, and, and it'll spook them. So anyway, there's lots to building a good birdhouse. You can't just put up anything. But again, there are lots and lots of sites and I'm happy to, to uh, direct you to those sites if you're interested in this. So one way to give them shelter is to put up a birdhouse. But you can also do much more natural things. Um, you can leave up snags. And a snag's just a fancy name uh, for a dead tree that's still standing. Um, and they are widely used by birds because as the wood inside them rots, it gets soft and it gets invaded by insects. And again, birds like to eat insects. Um, so, I mean, so it's providing food for them. It's providing shelter. Uh, a lot of birds nest in dead trees. Again, uh, dead trees preferably because the wood is much soft, softer for them. In fact, about 25%, one quarter of all uh, Pacific Northwest birds use snags or will use snags in one way or another. Um, so if you have a dead tree in your property, uh, a good thing to do is just cut enough of it off so it's not going to fall on your house and take some of the larger limbs down and uh, leave it standing. Leave it standing. I have two snags in my yard uh, that are close to the house. And um, it took a couple of years. It took about two years for it to rot enough, them to rot enough to be useful for birds. But now they're just about the birdiest spots in my yard. And I do see pileated all the time there. Okay, so we've got houses, we've got snags. Then brush piles, brush piles. These are particularly important if you don't have a lot of bushes on your property. If you've got bushes, then they're, they're less important. Um, I sometimes get pushed back when I talk about uh, brush piles because people say, oh, that's so messy. Oh, it's so ugly. And if you've got a really manicured looking yard, I mean, it, 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 it's not what, what goes there. But if you have an unused corner, you know, in the back of your property or, you know, kind of hidden away, uh, it's a great, great, great thing to do. And the way you build a brush, brush pile is you build it the way you would build a campfire. Um, you know, so you start with some big branches on the bottom and you kind of make a, a, a teepee or pyramid kind of shape and you leave open spaces uh, so that the birds can get in there. Uh, you know, so kind of a loose pile of bushes and um, uh, of limbs. And you'll find that it really attracts birds. And there are birds that use the inside of the pile. There are birds that use the outside of the pile, but it gives them shelter. It gives them food because insects tend to congregate there. Um, so brush piles are just terrific things. And then, um, let's see what comes next. Leaf litter. There's my, my junko. Leaf litter. Um, you know, this is great. I'm telling you, you don't have to rake up every leaf in your yard, which is wonderful. Just, just you know, rake up, you know, just get some piles of leaves and leave them. It's that simple. And again, if you don't like the look, then find a hidden corner to do it. But leaf litter, um, 
definitely attracts insects who, who go under the leaves for shelter. And so a lot of ground feeding birds get a lot of food there. They also collect water. It provides shelter and hiding places for all sorts of animals, including birds. Um, so that's a really simple thing you can do to make your yard more bird friendly. Um, and then you can plant bushes. Bushes are just terrific. Uh, for birds. And there are a lot of birds that, you know, a lot of people, they don't know anything about birds. They think birds are always high up, but that's not true. There are a lot of birds that like staying close to the ground. Um, and so bushes are just terrific, terrific, terrific habitat for them, especially if they have berries, but they don't need to have berries. Open limbed ones are best. Again, so there are lots of cavities and natural spaces that the birds can go in there to hide from. And a good, great native example is, is, is our native roadie. Um, which is just perfect for birds. I think one of the reasons I have so many birds in my yard is because I have so many native roadies. Um, and I have them near my bird feeders. And I get a lot of birds that um, wouldn't normally or don't, so, don't like to come to feeders because they're very shy, but because they're only a couple of feet from the bushes, they, they hide in the bushes all the time and then quickly you know, run to the feeder and get food. So give them shelter give them water. Uh, I put a pond in my yard this year and uh, I've always had, uh, you know, bird baths, but I put a pond in. It's about, uh, oh, maybe 15 feet by eight feet, give or take. And I can tell you that uh, in the morning, uh, you know, we might have 10 birds in the, in, in the pond. Um, yes, birds desperately need water. Birds need to drink and they need to bathe all year round and you probably can figure that out, but what you might not know is that, it, well, let me, let me be this clear. Planting native plants is probably arguably the single best thing you can do for birds' health. If you want to attract birds to your yard, probably the single best thing you can do is give them water. And that's because um, when birds have hatchlings, when they have babies, they sometimes make 200 trips a day to get them water. The only way they can get their babies water is to find a water so source, get water in their little tiny beaks and fly back to the nest. And they have to do that like 200 times a day. And so if they see a good water source, that's where they're gonna build their nests near there. It is just a super thing to do if you wanna attract birds. Um, some bird baths are better than others. This is another one where people sell all sorts of things because they're pretty, but that doesn't make them good for birds. So what makes a good bird bath? Um, first off, it should have shallow water because most birds don't like to get their bodies wet. They go up to mid thigh or so. So we're talking very shallow. Um, if you want it to have different depths than, than uh, bird baths with sloping sides, uh, gently sloping sides are a good shape to look for. The water in general should be between about one and three inches. Um, you also want it to be made of a rough material. Ceramic isn't good, for example, because you don't want the birds to slip and slide. Um, if, if, if you have one that's made of a smooth material, I'd throw some sand or gravel uh, in the bottom at least. But if I were buying one, I wouldn't get one that was smooth and ceramic. You also want to avoid metal because they because they heat up. Um, also, bird baths should be cleaned periodically. The best way to clean them in the summer, every week or so maybe, is just dump the water out and make a mixture that's uh, 10 to one water to bleach and just put it in there for a few minutes, dump it out and fill it with, you know, rinse it out and fill it with fresh water. So you don't need an elaborate cleaner, but you do need uh, to clean it or else bacteria will grow. Okay. And then we want to provide birds with food. And um, there are different types of food you can provide. There are insects. There are, I can't see that, but I think that's my seed eater there. And berries and nectar. So uh, different types of food. And as I keep saying, and I am preaching to the converted, a great way to do this is to plant native plants. So I want to talk about planting natives for a few minutes now. Um, if you want to increase the number of native plants in your garden, and who here doesn't, uh, the first thing you have to do is make room for them. And one way to make room for them, or one of the great ways, is to get rid of invasives, things we don't want to have anyway, like pull up your English ivy. Uh,
um, which pokes out native plants, you know, or God forbid broom <laughs> um, that, that just takes over everything. So, you know, uh, take out some other plants, especially unwanted plants to make room for them. And another thing you can do is reduce the size of your lawn. You can put in more bushes, you can put in more flower beds, you can put in more ground cover, but lawns, um, are really deserts when it comes to supporting wildlife. There are very few birds. Robins are like the big exception. Um, juncos are somewhat of an exception, but they don't prefer lawns. They just can tolerate lawns. Lawns are provide very, very little for most birds. You're, you're really better off without them. I'll show you what I did this summer. Um, this is a chunk of my front lawn. You can see the edge of my pond there. Um, but uh, in the center, it looks like I've got, you know, if you just took a casual look, you'd say, oh, that person needs to mow her grass. But it's not grass. I put in, it's not quite native, but I put in 100% clover. And I'm doing that all over my yard. I've got patches and I'm going to keep filling in. Um, and I actually used, it's not native, it's a cultivar. Um, that's called mini clover. And the reason I planted it is it grows four or five inches tall. So this is what it looks like unmowed uh, in a season where we don't have flowers. You can mow it if you want to, it tolerates mowing. Once it's established, you don't need to water it. You don't need to do anything to it. It's very hardy. But the reason I like it is several fold. One is, is you don't have to water it. Uh, it's very hardy, but two in the summer, it's covered with white flowers that bees love. So I have thousands and thousands of bees uh, in my yard. And also snakes love it because um, it, it's thinner underneath the surface than grasses. And there's a lot of room for, for snakes and skinks and things like that. And so my wildlife are very happy. Um, and I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm, I'm very pleased with, with uh, how the clover has been working. Um, okay, another thing about planting natives is if you're gonna plant for birds, think vertically because different birds like to be different heights above the ground. So for example, um, the top layer, the top layer high up in the canopy, if, and, and not everybody has the, the uh, possibility of having large trees, but if you have large trees, what you'll find is that birds like swallows and pine siskins that tend to stay near the top of tall trees. And if you don't have tall trees, you're not gonna probably get them. Um, then there are birds that kind of like to be in the middle um, of a tree. Things like kinglets and chickadees and nuthatches tend to be sort of in the middle, not on the ground, but low down or where you find hummingbirds and goldfinch and say bush tit. And then around here, we have tons of birds that like to be in the shrub or floor layer. Um, so our thrushes and wrens and towhees and song sparrow um, stay low. So the more different heights you can have, it doesn't have to all be the same plant, you know, the more different heights you can have, the greater the variety of birds you can attract. So think about putting in plants that will mature to different layers. Another thing you want to think of is variety. Uh, don't do, don't, don't plant that hedge on the left. What you want, you don't want a hedgerow, you want, you know, variability. You can put different things that are providing different things for birds. And, and you'll find, again, that, 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 that you'll attract a lot more birds, um, you know, with, with the configuration on the right than on the left. Another thing to think about when you're planting your natives is think about time, because birds need food all year round. So you're going to want some plants that are providing food in the spring, some that are providing food in the summer, some that are providing food in the fall, and some that are providing food in the winter. Um, you know, so try to think about, you know, when are berries being produced? When, um, you know, are they flowering? Different times, the, again, the more variety you can do, the, the more birds, different types of birds you're gonna attract. Whether you're talking about natives or cultivars, don't deadhead. My neighbors don't like this, but uh, uh, I let my plants go to seed and I let my birds eat the seed. Uh, great natural food for birds. So, so a great way to feed birds is by providing native plants that are providing food for them. And we have so many native plants here that provide food and I'll get back to that in a bit. 
But I did want to talk about bird feeders. I'm a big believer in bird feeders, especially in the colder months. And I used this picture because I wanted to show that you don't have to spend a lot of money on a bird feeder. Um, you know, this is just an old Coke bottle with some wooden spoons stuck through it. Um, and it's also a great project to do with kids. Um, but I could spend an hour all by itself talking about, uh, about bird feeders. Um, but let me give you some tips. Uh, there are lots of different types of bird feeders and different birds tend to prefer different types. But I think more important than type for most bird is what you're putting in the feeder. And this feeder actually is exactly wrong. Um, this is not, not what you'd want to put in the feeder. Uh, those small whitish round dots you see are millet. And when you buy cheap bird food, it's mostly millet because it's the cheapest grain that they put in there. The problem is very few birds really like millet. So what happens is, is they pull it out and they throw it on the ground. This means most of it goes to waste. And it also, and I'll come back to this in just a second, it can attract rocks and other vermin. So what you wanna probably do is have uh, different feeders that all have only one type of food in it and there's no reason to buy any millet. Uh, there are such things as squirrel proof feeders that work pretty well, but, but usually it's, just not that super easy to do. You have to play with it for a while. Um, but I did want to talk about how to uh, avoid pests because I get that question so often. I want to feed the birds, but I'm afraid of attracting rats. What can I do? Can I feed them? And the answer is yes, as long as you do certain things. Generally with rats, rats become a problem when there's a lot of spillage on the ground. So again, avoid millet and things that the birds are going to spill out. A second thing you can do is what you've got here is some sort of a, a platform under the feeder that catches anything that they spill because uh, it's bigger than the feeder and then none of it or almost none of it ends up on the ground. Uh, so some sort of a tray. Another thing you can do is not fill up your feeder, but just give them a little bit of food every morning or every other morning, you know, you know don't have to do it literally every day. Um, and so that all of the food gets eaten before nightfall. You know, if you only feed them a little bit in the morning, by the time the day is over, the food's all gone. There's nothing there to attract rats. And if you really are desperate, um, you can always feed hummingbirds. Hummingbird feeders do not attract rats. The other thing you can do is you can make your food sticky. Because again, the point is, is to keep food off the ground. And so this is a simple device, and there are lots of different companies that do it, where you can just fill a jar with peanut butter. In this case, they added some mealworms to it, or you can melt some suet and put stuff in it, but uh, nothing's going to fall out of there, and so you're not going to attract rats. And again, there's always inexpensive ways to do the same thing. Um, you know, you can, this is a great project with kids or grandkids where you take a tube of uh, toilet paper roll, you know, an empty roll of toilet paper, you smear peanut butter, and then you roll it in seeds. Um, just not enough is going to fall to the ground for it to be a, you know, a, a rat problem. Okay, so there's my give them food, give them shelter, give them water. I have a few other ideas I wanted to mention. So my other ideas of, of ways to make your, you know, to be good to birds. Um, these are a little bit more far flung. First off, vote. Vote the environment. I mean, if you want to do something good for birds and for our habitat in general, vote for politicians who care about the environment. Uh, so, you know, enough said, an election coming up. Another thing you can do is reduce your own carbon footprint because, again, climate change is going to be the biggest killer of birds over the next 30 or 40 years. So, you know, reduce your food waste, use less gas, use less electricity. Reuse things, you know, rather than throwing them away. Um, try to recycle, you know, all the things to not make us manufacture goods, not not to make us have to put things in landfills. Uh, you know, all of that is good for birds. Let me close by telling you about a terrific resource that you probably don't know about, uh, but will really help you if you're interested in putting native plants in your garden for birds. The National Audubon Society has an initiative called Plants for Birds, okay? So if you just type in uh, into your browser, Audubon Society Plants for Birds, 
uh, this, you know, and then, then you go to the, you know, what comes up. Um, this is what you'll get. They're their plants for birds initiative. And it has different features, but you don't need most of it probably because you're all good gardeners. But oh, there it is, audubon.org slash plants for birds. But when you get, they've got one section called native plants database. And if what you do is you type in your zip code and then hit search, this is what comes up. Uh, so this is her 98531. It'll give you best results, which are the ones they think are like foolproof to plant. Full results, which are things that are found in your area, but you know the, the difference between two are these, that these are also plants that are not necessarily really easy to grow. And then it's got all these filters. So you can filter by type of plant, meaning are you looking for a tree? Are you looking for a shrub? Are you looking for a vine? Are you looking for a perennial, whatever? what plant resource you're looking for, meaning are you looking for a nectar source? Are you looking for a berry? Are you looking for edible leaves? Um, and attracts. Is there a particular type of bird you're trying to attract? And if you put that in, it'll come up with a more constrained list. So in this case, I put in that I want to attract cardinals and grosbeaks. Okay, that's what I want to attract. And so it comes up with 24 best results. And if you scroll down, you'd come up with 24. Uh, plants that will, in particular, attract grosbeaks. Um, again, instead, I could, you know, pick some, some or all. You know, I'm only looking for vines that attract grosbeaks, something like that. Uh, so here I said uh, any type of bird, but I'm looking for, you know, plant, little tiny plants rather than shrubs or, or trees. And it, you know, here's what we have. And um, yeah, this is just a terrific resource for you guys because these are native plants that grow in our zip code or whatever your zip code is um, that are good for birds. And, and you even know exactly what bird it's good for. And so in closing, I just wanna say, you are what hope looks like to a bird. All of us can help birds survive. Um, and plant, putting native plants in your garden is you know just like, the, just about the best thing you can do to, to achieve that end. So, so thank you for your interest in this. Um, and, and I hope you actually do some of these things. Anyway, I'm done. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm back. So um, I had forgotten to mention that if you guys have any questions, just put them in the chat or in the Q&A and I will um, read them to Kim. This is the part I hate. This is being on the hot spot, hot seat. So are you gonna read questions to me? I am gonna read questions, but. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if, uh, this is one, If you, uh, this is from Sandy. She said, if you're going to pick one or two really valuable shrubs for birds, what would they be? Oh my gosh, you know, honestly, this, it's one of the things I love about living here. There's virtually no native berry bush that wouldn't be the right answer to that question, except maybe for snowberries. Most birds will eat snowberries, but they're like their last choice. But I mean, if you want to plant, you know, native blackberry, you want to plant huckleberry, you want to plant salmonberry, you want to plant nitka roses, you want to plant, I mean, you know, thimbleberry, they're all terrific. I wouldn't say that one of them is more terrific than the other, especially because they come to, uh, they produce their berries at different times. Um, but anything but snowberry that has berries and is native, I mean, salal, Oregon grape, go for it. <laughs> They're all wonderful. Twin berries are wonderful. Elderberries are wonderful. Um, okay, great. Um, so the next question is um, from Mike and he says, thank you so much. I am humbled by how much I learned from you. What are some of the resources that you said you could refer us to for more info? Well, if you email me, and I, I trust that, Gail, you can get my email out to people. Um, I have compiled lists of uh, 
resources on different topics. So if what you're interested in is birdhouses, I can just email you a list of sites that talk about birdhouses. Or if you're interested in, you know, uh, you know, what kind of feeders work, I've got lists of websites, you know, and I can send you all their, you know, their uh, addresses, and you, you can look them up. So that, that's what I mean that I have. And I've done that because I'm actually in charge of a new initiative that Black Hills Audubon has. So I'm going to uh, promote it right now. Um, a lot of people during this COVID shutdown have gotten, have developed a new interest in bird watching because they're at home, you know, and, and it's a way of seeing nature from your yard. And so in order to help beginner birders, but, but we'll take any birding question at all, we've set up what I call an email hotline um, and uh, what it's addresses is questions for BHAS, just like that, questions for BHAS, BHAS is capitalized at gmail.com, and I monitor it every day, and, um, you know, if you've got any sort of question uh, about birds, I mean, from identification, like, I'm seeing this weird bird in my yard, and I don't know what it is, to I want to put up a birdhouse, to, you know, I'm having hawk problems. I mean, I, it, you know, I found an injured bird, whatever it is. Um, the, the point is, is to help people who are interested in birds. So feel free to use that email. So that's questions for BHAS, BHAS capitalized at gmail.com. Okay, and what we'll do is um, when your uh, presentation gets posted, um, we can have some uh, text around uh, on the page and, and we okay. can put some of these uh, links on uh, and your email in mm -hmm. uh, for there. Um, so uh, he also asked the second question, which is, do you serve any fruits or vegetables to your birds in the winter? Um, you can, it seems to be less, I've only lived here about seven years. And um, when I lived in the Midwest, putting food out was really useful. There were a bunch of birds you get, especially Orioles, that wouldn't come unless you put fruit out. But everyone here tells me that fruit doesn't attract anything. So the answer is I don't, because that's the advice I get. I put out suet that has sometimes some fruit in it, but but usually not, but, but different you know, just whatever I can find, different types of suet with seeds or nuts in it. I have three different uh, seed feeders that have different seeds in them because uh, some birds like, really like uh, the big uh, black oil sunflower seeds. Um, some like the, if they, we call them, call it thistle, but it's Niger. Um, they're really Niger seeds, which are much smaller. Um, and then I've got kind of a mix that I use. And then I've got a couple of hummingbird feeders. Um, so no, I do not. I sometimes put out mealworms in the winter too, um, but really not so much because I've got so many big trees. A lot of, uh, a lot of birds that, that take insects in the winter around here, glean them from the bark of trees like nuthatches do that, for example, and some woodpecker. Um, but you certainly can. But no, fruit is about the one thing that doesn't seem to work so well around here. I do not know why, but that's what everybody tells me. Okay, um, Phyllis asks, um, she has a separate native plant garden, but it doesn't seem to attract birds. And she's wondering why. So that's sort of generic, but maybe you can get it to a can she can she say a little more about it? Um, like, is it is it all small plants? Is it, um, you know, can she describe it just a little bit more? Uh, like, okay, Phyllis, add some more, and then we'll come back to your question. That'll be good. And you mm -hmm. can put that in the Q and A. That's fine where you were. Um, so, uh, so there's two questions here about that clover. So, can you? Um, talk about, uh, like, they were asking where it was from, where they can get it. Is it an annual or a perennial? Does it, um, is it invasive? Okay. Um, given that I've only had it this summer, I can't 100% answer all those questions, but I can tell you how I got it. I got it from American Meadows 
uh, which is a company that you that you buy from online that has this one patented variety of short clover. I mean, like I really wanted the four to six inch height um, and it comes in the form of seeds. And so I seeded my lawn in patches and I did it in patches so I could stand there and water it well in the beginning because I did this at a really bad time. I mean, I first planted it in July when it was already hot. Um, and I haven't noticed it being invasive and I've got some pretty empty, uh, you know, empty patches near it where it could have spread. It hasn't really, it hasn't, like I, ha I have a wild, a native wildflower border um, that in places is a little scraggly. It hasn't, that touches it and it hasn't invaded into that. Um, it's supposed to be if they're not perennial, they self seed. So, in, you know, in effect, it never, it's supposed to be green all year round. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't go away. It's not like you have to do this every year, um, according to their website. And I'm believing them. Um, so that's what I can tell you about it. I mean, there's plenty of different clovers you can buy, but of course, a lot of clovers uh, are, are quite a bit taller. And I, I made the decision that I didn't want to mow. Um, because I really wanted all the flowers. But again, if you don't want flowers, get a taller style and then mow it, and then you get, you know, just solid green. Um, so Marion uh, asks, uh, have you heard of a bird nister branch? It, uh, it's a, a fab tiny water tubes that wound around large branch with small, uh, uh, animalizers and juncos and goldfish and sparrows and nuthatches, etc. Like the mist. Well, it doesn't surprise me that birds might like mist. I've never used one, so I'm sorry I can't really say anything about it. it. Wouldn't surprise me if they'd like it. I think more useful though really would be a simple bird bath because then they can not only and get cool if they want to get cool, but they can also drink and they can also wash themselves. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but but if I were going to invest in something, I'd just invest in a bird bear. Great, and uh, maybe we'll, Marion will share a picture of that sometime with us. Yeah, and I'd be curious to know more about it because yeah. I, well, I mean, all I can tell you is I don't know anyone who has one of those, and I know lots of people who are birders. You know, I mean, I'm talking about my my bird birding friends. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll mm -hmm. find out more about that. Um, can you please tell us more? Oh, wait, we did that one. Um, what is the name of the program at Audubon Org again? Okay. Oh, we'll put that in the, um, we'll put that out on when the, the presentation gets posted. Um, we'll make sure that goes out there, but you can repeat that again. Yeah, it's just called Plants for Birds. So if you type in National Audubon Society, Plants for Birds, um, that's what comes up. Okay. Um, uh, any recommendations, plant or otherwise, for encouraging birds uh, native to the Pacific Northwest and de discouraging invasive bird species? That's an interesting question. Let me think for a minute. Are there, are there any species in particular they're thinking about? Uh, they did not specify, but well, just, yeah, not, not specific, just more focusing on our, our native birds and less on the invasive ones. Okay, because I'm trying to think about what invasive birds they may be meaning. I mean, when, when people have problems with invasive birds, starlings are probably the number one I can think of, and then house sparrows. Um, you know, that's one that if I thought about it, Again, I'm happy to share my email. That, that's one that I think if I thought about it, I could come up with a really good answer. Okay. But at the top of my head, you know, it depends on how, uh, there aren't that many invasive yard birds around here except for starlings and, and minorly house sparrows compared to most of the rest of the US. Um, and that's why I'd need to think about it. Okay, it's great. just not a problem except for starlings and starlings are hard. Uh, to deal with. Okay, that's another one that we could add to the uh, web. Yeah, I'm happy to think about that more, yeah. but nothing jumps out because unlike some other places I've lived, it's just not such a big problem around here usually. 
Okay. And, I mean, um, and if you mean invasive here, sometimes people mean birds that are actually native to the Pacific Northwest, but they're not common in our area. So for example, where I live, 10 years ago, we had tons and tons of stellar jays and almost no scrub jays, California scrub jays. Now there are more and more California scrub jays as there's a lot of development and there's a lot more clearing. They're Pacific Northwest native birds. They're not quite the birds that used to be here, you know, as opposed to really birds that don't belong in the Pacific Northwest, period. All right, so Rita asked, do birds use day length to determine when to migrate? They use a bunch of things. It's kind of a compl complicated calculus and it also depends upon what species, but day length is certainly a big part of it. And that's why they're out of sync with insects because insects do not use day length, they use temperature. And so when the temperature and the day length don't line up the way they used to do, that's where you get the mistiming. And that's, that's what part of the problem is. The other problem with birds um, delaying migration, which is what usually happens because things are warmer, is then they're, it certainly doesn't always happen, but they're more likely to be, to be stuck by, uh, you know, um, they stay where they're supposed to stay in the winter longer, uh, then, then they hit a storm that they weren't expecting. You know, then all of a sudden the temperature goes down to where it's supposed to be and they're you know, they're too far north in a big snowstorm. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. And that that's really intuitive of you. And yeah, that's the reason that's the big problem is birds use temperature to a certain degree, but day length is the bigger factor for them. Right. Um, so do you have a few beloved, very dog-eared books that you read and reread, especially regarding birds in the Pacific Northwest? Oh my gosh. That I do you don't mean do you mean field guides or do you mean books about? Um, I mean the the most serious field guide, and I say this as an Audubon member, is Sibley. I mean if if you if you're looking for what is the best book uh, to to see, uh, you know, and and get some information about Pacific Northwest birds, I I think there's nothing like Sibley. Um, and you can get Sibley's Birds of the Western United States. He doesn't have one specifically for uh, the Pacific Northwest. There is a bird, uh, a book, excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I, written by Bob Morse. That's only Birds of the Pacific Northwest. And so that's nice. If you're kind of a, if you're, if you're a be, kind of a beginner birder, it's nice to start with a book that it may not have every rare species, but it has only Pacific Northwest birds. And, and in fact, the, his book is Birds of the Pacific, uh, of, of the Puget Sound region. So it's really, really local, beautiful photos. And, um, uh, you know, you won't get distracted by birds that, that, that aren't here. The only problem with the Morse book is that, um, like I said, if, if, if you're a, a real, you know, a more experienced birder and it's something rare that you're trying to figure out, the really rare birds aren't in there. It's common birds. But for a beginner, the Morse book is, is fine. It's small. Um, but, you know, the, the Bible to, to most serious birders is Sibley. Great. Thanks. Um, so uh, the the invasive bird that was being asked about was the house sparrows. If you want to talk about. Oh, birds. house sparrows. Okay. Um, house sparrows. See, I haven't had that problem around here. Uh, house sparrows are very aggressive and they tend to displace local sparrows. Um, again, let me, please email me and I will find you a good answer to that. I don't have one off the top of my head because you're really unlucky because house sparrows are generally not that big a problem. So, um, like I said, I'm happy to think about it and come up with a good answer. Okay, that sounds good. And he he specifically is in the city, so that's probably ah, that's probably the, why. Okay, that's probably why, um, because our native sparrows, with the exception of song sparrows, tend to be shyer than house sparrows are. Um, yeah, so actually, that's a good excuse for me to research the answer to that question. I look forward to doing it, and I will come up with something. There's another person that has a mister. So we're gonna research a little bit about that and why uh, put something out more on that. Um, oh, so some, um, uh, 
Uh, somebody wrote in Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Tallamy. Tal yes, I've heard of his books. Yes, uh, is a good book. All right, let me get a couple more here that are in the Q&A. Um, uh, oh, there's been a decline in owl populations. I have a gazillion rabbits in my yard, but no owls. <laughs> uh, where there used to be more nesting ground, uh, great horn owls a few years ago. Anything that you have a comment on those, on that? Well, um, yeah, they, they are in decline. Um, they're in decline because they need snags uh, to, to breed in. And so as more and more forested land gets cleared uh, and dead trees get taken down, there's no place for them to nest. That's why there are fewer great horned owls. Um, let's see, what can you do to attract great horned owls? I, see, you're making me feel very ignorant. Um, I mean, what they need to be around your property is an appropriate place to build a nest. I have personally never seen one live anywhere but in a snag. I mean, that's definitely their preferred home. I'm wondering if there are other owls you could attract that wouldn't be big enough probably to take a full grown rabbit, but could take a little rabbit. Um, so there are some other owls that you could probably attract um, by giving them a suitable nest box. Um, and I'm thinking maybe a barn owl, you might, that's probably your best bet for something artificial. And they'd only be able to take babies. They wouldn't be able to take adults. And, and that, by the way, everybody's been complaining about this. I mean, the rabbit population has just exploded. They, they breed like rabbits and, 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 and they're all over the place. Um, yeah, I, I would think that, that if I wanted something that was going to kill rabbits, keep or chase rabbits away, I might be trying to think of some way to attract barn owls. And I think that there'd be a suitable nest box you could build, something you could do to attract a barn owl. Okay. Um, uh, do you feed hummingbirds uh, in the winter? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it you can argue that that's the most important bird here to feed in the winter because we only have two species of hummers who live here and one of them is here only in the summer, the rufous hummingbird, the one that's orange. The one that's here year round is called an Anna's hummingbird. That's the one that's kind of green with a violet purple gorget or bib if you prefer that term. Um, and they don't belong here. This is really interesting. Most people don't know this. They didn't used to live here. They only used to live in the chaparral of Southern California. And now they're found all the way up into British Columbia. But the reason why is that people come and plant. And in this case, not just native plants, but they, they just plant ornamental plants with, with flowers that, 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 that feed them. And so they're really in a tough way here in the winter. If people didn't put out feeders, they would all die. I mean, they, they, you know, there are no flowers here in the winter and, and that's what they eat. Um, and so, yes, I mean, absolutely. If, if you're gonna feed anything in the winter, hummingbird food is actually the thing that's probably most important for those birds. Um, the other way they just survive the winter here and they actually can live further north than any other hummingbird. Hummingbirds really are tropical birds. Um, is, is because they can lower their body temperature uh, really dramatically low to uh, uh, conserve energy. But yes, please, 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 if, you, if you've got any interest at all, feed your hummingbirds. They have no other food source in the winter. And so if you put the hummingbird solution out in the winter, you will get hummers. I mean, I usually get, oh my gosh, in the winter, I can have eight hummers not at any one time, but but I but I can count eight hummers in my yard uh, in the winter. I've got two hummingbird feeders. All right, so Phyllis has come back with what her garden, her native yeah. garden is like. So mm -hmm. let me describe this to you, and I think this will give you some more hints. Okay. Um, uh, uh, it's on the courtyard off the side of the garage. It's surrounded by rocks that are already there, 
and there is one tree, a maple, and probably 10 to 215 native plants, most of them local. There's only one shrub and several ferns. Okay, well then I'll go back to what I was saying before. Um, I, if I were gonna plant anything new, I'd plant shrubs. I mean, that, that, that sounds like, you know, something doable. You can't import, you know, big trees, but, but, but if even small shrubs, um, you know, like, a, like, like, yeah, there's even small shrubs or salal um, or a tall Oregon grape would, would, would work. The other thing really is put in water. I mean, when in doubt, put in a water source. Okay. Um, uh, just someone else, it was an answer to the question about the shrubs somebody asked, and, but they replied back with um, snowberries provide good cover and are not um, uh, recommended because they take over and don't produce edible berries. Mm -hmm. I might've missed this, uh, came in late. I've, I've seen hummingbirds at the flowers and towhees scratch under the ground under them. So um, yeah, they're not worthless. It's just that I think if you lined up berries and said, which are the most worthwhile to the least worthwhile, those would go towards the bottom of the list. Yeah. You uh, know, it's, they're not worthless, but you know, if instead of a snowberry, you planted a salmonberry or a thimbleberry or a huckleberry or an elderberry, they'd be even happier. Right. Um, Kevin had asked, um, have you heard of the die off in New Mexico? And how did they die, in your opinion? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I know I have, and I'm sitting here blanking on what species died. What species died? Kevin, let us know. Let us know. Because, yes, I have heard of it, and I'm totally blanking. Because the, 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 the die-off that's closer to home here um, are uh, seabirds. Um, which are dying off in great numbers uh, in, in Puget Sound. Both shorebird type and deeper type water are, are just dying off in droves. But yeah, I remember reading something about a die off in. Okay, well, we'll yeah, make that, that um, we can maybe get to more of that um, in some of the response. So just to remind you um, on, uh, on Wednesday, this recording will be posted. Um,